Good morning, church family. It's so good to see you this morning and we can't wait to worship together. If this is your first time with us, we are so glad that you're here. We'd love to get to know you, so go ahead and text the word guest to 77069. We're happy to help with any questions you may have. Here at Champion Forest, we are passionate about all people coming to know Christ through the message of the gospel. And we believe that each and every one of us are called to pursue this mission. That includes you, and we have an exciting day coming up where you can learn all about going on mission and getting involved in our community. Missions Day is happening in just a couple of weeks on October 20th, and we want you to be a part of it. We'll have missionaries and local partners with us, as well as information on all of our mission trips for 2025. So be praying now about where God is calling you and how you can be a part of making disciples, loving our community, and strengthening the church through missions with us. As always, for all the details you need on events coming up around the church, check out the weekly news and get plugged in. Once again, welcome to Champion Forest. It's gonna be a great Sunday. Let's worship together as we remember the joy of the Lord. Good morning, church family. Is there joy in the room this morning? Let's stand to our feet and lift up a shout of praise and offer up thanksgiving to Jesus for this is the day that he's made. Sing. This is the day you made. So I will rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. And this is where I believe That you are more than enough More than enough for me Let's sing That you are faithful to your promise You are strong when I am weak When I'm standing in your presence I have everything I need the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh my soul, bless his name, all that is in me say. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And Jesus, this is our prayer. Come one day, you are worthy of all, worthy of all my praise. Oh, yeah, and you are faithful to your promise. You are strong when I am weak. When I'm standing in your presence, I have everything. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Superstar. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Tell your soul, oh my soul, bless His name. All that is within me said. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh 
that we get to gather in this place to bless your name. We are free today to bless you, to worship and adore the name above all other names. And that name is Jesus. Can you shout Jesus? Come on, shout his name, Jesus. Those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus, he won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus, they won't be shaken. Come on and praise the
We're just so glad that we get to celebrate the grace that we just sang about. I love that line in that song. It says, come on and bring your offering. Sing if you've known his grace. And I don't know about you, but I've seen God's grace in my life. I'm sure you've seen God's grace in your life. And what I'm really excited about today here at Champion Forest is that we have lives that are demonstrating the grace that they've received. Lives that have demonstrated that they've been transformed by the power of Jesus. And so we have some individuals here at the baptistry. So would you turn your attention there and we're gonna celebrate with them as we do here at Champion Force. When they come out of those waters, let's celebrate with all of heaven and rejoicing that they are now dead to sin and alive in Christ. Let's turn our attention to the baptistry. Church family, this is Ariana Howard. Ariana, have you trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life? It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Melissa Tafola. Melissa, have you received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life? It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Two more getting baptized. This is Jackson. Jackson, have you asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Awesome. Well, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, Mia. And this is Mia. Mia, have you asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. What a joy. Hallelujah. What an honor it is to see people identified with Christ. We're so glad that you're here this morning. If it's your first time worshiping with us here at Champion Forest, on behalf of our entire team, we welcome you. And if you would, just in the next few moments, text the word guest to 77069. Again, text the word guest to 77069. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love the opportunity to let you know what's happening here at Champion Force. So much is going on. We are seeing lives changed. We are loving on our community and we're strengthening the church. That is what we are known for, and that's what we intend to live by. So again, if that's if it's your first time here, make sure you text the word guest to 77069. And speaking of guests, we do have a guest here on stage, and this is Michael Neal, everyone. And Michael is an incredible songwriter. You can give it up for him, yeah. As I said, he's an incredible songwriter, worship leader, author, but more than that, what I love so much about Michael is that his heart is for the Lord. His heart is for the people of God. All he longs to do is to glorify and magnify the name of Jesus. He's become a great friend of ours, of our team. He's a great friend of Pastor Jared's. So I invite you as we stand, as we continue to sing, he's gonna lead us in a few songs this morning, but would you just stand all over the place? And as you're standing, give it up one more time for Michael Neal as he leads us this morning. It's great to be with you, church family. Um, I was thinking of Psalm 63 this morning. Oh God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. My whole body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary, beheld your power and glory, and because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I'm so thankful that we serve a God who did not stay far away. He was Emmanuel, God with us, more close than we can ever imagine. Ultimately, laying his life down so that we could be forgiven and stand before him without fault or blemish. I'm so grateful today. Let's lift our hearts and our eyes, continue to worship him. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence here walking in the dirt with you and me i'm thankful 
Oh, he knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Lift it up. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Oh, hallelujah. Imagine you are distant and removed, but you chase us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you grace, and the broken you embrace, and in the end the proof is in your wounds. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, in the end the proof.
There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made. Come on, you know it. Sing it out. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe is Come on, every voice. Then sings my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my prayer right now. Father, that is the cry of our heart. It is the confession of our lives, of this church. Lord, to magnify your name, to tell you how great and good you are. We acknowledge, Lord, your presence in this moment. We know that you are here according to the scripture where two or three are gathered in your name. You're here. Lord, we know you inhabit the praises of your people, and we welcome you into this place. Lord, would you, in just a few moments, through the teaching and preaching of your word, speak to our hearts, challenge us. Lord, from your word, may your spirit search us and know us. God, there are so many needs represented in this room. And Lord, we know across the world, we pray right now for world events taking place. What's going on? In Israel, in the Middle East, Lord, we're reminded every time we turn on the news of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Lord, these are huge issues here at home with the election coming up, with the floods taking place throughout Florida and in the Carolinas. God, we need you. We need you, oh God. And so we cry out to you today asking for your wisdom, asking for your power, asking for your strength. Lord, would you be our refuge and our shield and our provider and our protector? And Lord, would you meet needs and use your church to be an agent of change and showing your grace through our prayers, through our giving, through our encouragement, Lord, we want you to use us however you see fit. We pray today, God, in this service that your will would be done on earth and in our life as it is in heaven. 
And it is in the name that is above every name we pray, the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen. Go ahead and be seated. And as you're taking a seat, I want to encourage our ushers to come on forward to receive the morning offering. And you can go ahead and begin passing out the baskets. Thank you, Michael Neal, for being with us today and leading us in worship. Michael is a wonderful friend of mine, and we served in ministry together through the years. He is a prolific songwriter and a worship leader. He's an author. Uh, his book, The Way of Worship, The Heart of Worship, is used in Christian schools and seminaries that are training up worship leaders uh, literally around the world. He and his family just recently moved to Houston. So you're going to be seeing more of Michael. He's been helping us behind the scenes, uh, but he's moving his membership here to Champion Forest. And you'll see more and more of Michael in the days ahead and just grateful for his friendship. And uh, as the offering is being passed, I do want to remind you of your giving. Uh, you know, uh, many of you uh, supported our work in Haiti through filling up a shoebox. You'll see some video uh, behind me on the screen. And we filled up, you filled up, Champion Forest, nearly 1,500 shoeboxes that are going to Haiti uh, to meet needs there. The ladies that uh, help this ministry go forward. I think they sewed 4,000 dresses this year that they'll put in those shoe boxes and give to kids, little girls in need. And uh, it's just such a tremendous ministry. There's so many great things going on around our church. Uh, also, uh, we have a disaster relief fund that we call on you to fill through the years so that when something happens uh, in our nation, uh, we can release funds and don't have to uh, ask you for an added offering. We want you to know that we release $15,000 out of our disaster relief fund to send relief of the North American Mission Board. It's the third largest relief organization in the world, and uh, they work with churches to help meet the needs of the community. Uh, and so we are assessing what's going on in the Carolinas. We released $15,000. And if you would like to give to the, to the Disaster Relief Fund, you can just text the word RELIEF to 77069 and you can give 100% of what you give uh, goes to our relief efforts. Our executive pastor, Jeff Young, is headed to the North American Mission Board this week and he's going to assess uh, the needs a little bit more, see if there's any specific churches that we can help as well as what we're doing with Sin Relief. And so again, thank you uh, for your generosity. It's, it's going forward and it's helping people uh, who are greatly in need. I read this week that Hurricane Helene was the second deadliest hurricane in United States history. Uh, next to Katrina. And so you watch in the news, you know that the need is great. And so thank you for giving and thank you for praying. And uh, we're already talking with some churches uh, that are on the ground there, just seeing how that we, how, what more we can do, what we can help. Houston, if anybody knows about hurricanes and mud and outs, it's Houston. And I know when something like this happens, man, the empathy uh, just comes out of our hearts. And so again, uh, thank you for giving to, to make that possible. Speaking for me today is a wonderful friend of mine. I'm so excited to have him here, Dr. Robert J. Morgan. And uh, Dr. Morgan, speaking of a prolific author, he's authored some 35 books. Uh, Red Sea Rules is one of his best-selling books. We had our staff this summer uh, do a summertime reading, and we wrote his, uh, read his book, The Strength That You Need. Uh, his newest one is Whatever Happens. It's just a, a book on the book of Philippians. It's wonderful. Uh, he's written um, Then Sings My Soul, Stories Behind Hymns. Uh, if you went with us to the Holy Land a couple of years ago, Dr. Morgan came with me, and we co-taught. And I gave him all of the hard places in Israel. That's why I invited him along. I wanted you to have the hard spots, Dr. Morgan. But uh, he's a wonderful friend. Uh, he is the associate pastor of World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. For 42 years, he pastored the Donaldson Fellowship. He was married to his wife, Katrina, for 43 years. And she battled multiple, multiple sclerosis and went to be with the Lord in 2019. He stepped down. This is the kind of man he is. Stepped down from his pastorate so the last few years of his life he could caretake for his wife. He is a man of integrity, above reproach. He'll tell you a little bit more about his ministry when he gets us up here. But uh, would you go ahead and welcome Dr. Robert J. Morgan uh, to champion for us today. We love you, Dr. Morgan. We've got 250 pastors we got 250 pastors from all over North America coming in this evening, and we're going to be at the Lanier Library for a day and a half of a conference we're calling Let's Talk Preaching, and uh, we're bringing in a number of speakers to invest in these pastors. This is part of what it means to strengthen the church. This is why CF Connect as a ministry exists. And when I was looking at who we could invite in, I wanted someone to be able to preach that Sunday that was coming in. And I know of no one better to invest in preachers than Dr. Morgan. You'll see when he preaches, he knows how to exegete a text. 
Uh, he knows how to feed God's people by preaching the whole counsel of God. And again, just a mentor to me and a hero of mine. And so, Dr. Morgan, make yourself at home here in this pulpit. And we can't wait uh, to hear Psalm 23 is what he's going to be preaching on today. Right now, uh, Michael Neal and the team is going to lead us in worship. I talked about Michael being a, a prolific songwriter. You know, the Dove Awards were this past week in Nashville. And in 2012, Michael wrote a song called Your Great Name. And it was the song of the year, won a Dove Award that year for the song of the year. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about that song, set it up. And then he and the choir, they're going to sing it over us. And so I invite you to engage, to worship, and prepare your heart uh, to be blessed this morning, uh, not only by the music and worshiping the Lord, but by the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Thank you, Pastor Jarrett. All authority and all power is in the name that is above every name. And all throughout history and throughout the scriptures, God reveals himself and his names. And it's not just in the letters that spell the names, but it's in the nature of who our God is. He is mercy. He is forgiveness. He is love. He is Adonai, master and possessor of all things. He is Jehovah Jireh, what? My provider, everything I need. What do you need today? Call on his name. He is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of the unseen armies, the Lord of hosts. What are you fearing today? Call on his name. What's got you torn up inside? Got you anxious? Jehovah Shalom, he is our peace. He is El Rui, our shepherd. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord my righteousness. I don't have to carry my shame any longer, but I can walk into his presence because of his grace and mercy. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. El Shaddai, over all, he is the one who we worship today. And it's in his name, in his name alone. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why don't you stand back up in honor of his name. Lost our saved find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame, oh, at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place, oh, at the sound of your great name.
It's a little overwhelming to preach after hearing Michael lead us in that wonderful song the Lord led him to write. My path crosses with his from time to time, and I love that man and his music. And I love your pastor. If I had had the mind and the personality and the strategic instincts that Dr. Stevens had had, I could have been a good pastor. And you are very fortunate to have him here. If I lived in Houston, I would come every Sunday to sit under his ministry. And it's a real joy for me to be here. I live in Nashville. I have um, three daughters who all of them live within half an hour or so of me and 16 grandchildren. Some are biological and some are adopted and some are step-grandchildren, and some of them we don't know where they came from. <laughs> but I love uh, coming and being here. I appreciate Dr. Stevens inviting me. And I would like to tell you that I do have a weekly Bible study podcast. I'm going through the book of Zechariah right now, but it's simply the Robert J. Morgan podcast. And on social media every day, I put a very simple one-minute Bible study I go through, typically I go through books of the Bible, just one minute at a time. And the books that we have are available wherever you get your books. I'd love for you to check them out. I have a book coming out next spring called God Hasn't Forgotten You. So keep your eyes open for that. Years ago, I preached a series of sermons and did a book called The Lord is My Shepherd from Psalm 23, and I hadn't used that material for quite a while, and I was speaking somewhere recently where I had to, it was 12 hours during one week, and I got through 10 hours and realized I'd used up all of my material. So I went back and studied all over again this 23rd Psalm and did the last two sessions on that, and it's brought it all back to my mind again. So I would like to share that with you today, not in two hours, but just in the 30 minutes we have. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23, one of the most familiar passages, one that children used to memorize. I memorized it in the second grade in the public schools. I'm so uh, old that when I was growing up, we still memorized scripture in the government schools. They still need to be doing that. 
So now we have to make sure that our kids and grandkids memorize this psalm. I'm taking two of my grandchildren next week to um, Boston. I wrote a book called 100 Bible Verses That Made America. And I tell the story of, uh, of some of the individual Bible verses that had an impact on the founding of our country. And so I'm going to take uh, Owen and Liam, they're 11 and 9, to see the Mayflower and Plymouth Rock and the Freedom Trail in Boston and some things like that. And so I bought little keychains for them that has the Lord's Prayer on it. They don't know the Lord's Prayer. So my goal is to give them those keychains, pray it with them every day, go over it with them on the trip, and have them coming back knowing the Lord's Prayer. We have got to teach our children the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm and these scriptures. They can learn it so quickly when they're young, and it's so important. And the 23rd Psalm is so visual and wonderful. It stays with us all of our lives. So let me read it for you here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There are a couple of contextual issues with this psalm that I want to point out to you. One is where it is located in the book of Psalms, which we call the Psalter. The book of Psalms is made up of 150 individual psalms, but they have arrangements to them. And when you study a psalm, it helps if you study the one that came before and the one that came after, because very often there is a relationship between them. And when you read Psalm 22, it is a graphic prediction and portrayal of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's one of the great messianic chapters in all of the Bible. And it begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it talks about what it is like to be crucified. Now, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. And this is a thousand years before Christ. And yet, the psalmist here tells us what Jesus would say on the cross, what the people around him would say, what the other thieves would say, how they would treat him, what it would feel like. It's a very graphic description of the crucifixion, and it ends with allusions to the resurrection. Now, the psalm that follows the 23rd Psalm is Psalm 24, and the great theme of this is, open up your doors, O mighty gates, and the King of glory will come in. It has to do with the King coming, and it's an allusion to the return of Christ. So you put these three together, and you have Mount Calvary on one side and Mount Zion on the other, and between them is this lovely valley with its green pastures and still waters that we call the 23rd Psalm. So if you put them all, one after the other, you have the entire story of Jesus and the story of salvation. He died for us, He is living for us, He is coming for us. In the past, He was crucified for us and that gained our justification. In the future, He is coming for us and that gains our glorification. And right now, He is living for us and he enables our sanctification. So the 23rd Psalm is where we are living right now between the crucifixion and the resurrection, between the first coming and the second coming of the Lord. Now the second contextual issue is geographical. So I'd like to ask you to turn over to the book of Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis and chapter number 37. I think that this gives us the background for the 23rd Psalm. This is when Jacob sent his son, Joseph, to find the brothers who were herding their sheep. And it says in verse 12, now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel, or Jacob, said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he said to them, here I am. 
So he said to them, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. The patriarchs lived in Hebron down to the south of Jerusalem. And he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And when a man found him wandering in the fields, he asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they've gone away. And I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So the idea here is that sheep are migratory, but they cannot guide themselves. The dogs can, the cats know how to find their way back home. The birds have incredible instinctive migratory GPS systems in the little brain that God gave them. But sheep, they cannot tolerate the summer heat, but they can't find their way anywhere to find relief from it. And so you have to migrate with the sheep in very hot climates. And in Hebron, as the summer began to come along, it became very hot if you were on the Israel, well, we went in December. But if you go in the middle of the summer, it is unbearably hot down in this area. And so it's too hot for the sheep. So they have to, the shepherd has to take the flock near the end of the springtime up to Shechem, up to Dothan on this migratory pattern so that they are higher in altitude this is in the lower area of Galilee, and they have green grass still to eat, and they can function there through the summer, and then they come back home at the end of the season, and they winter over back in Hebron. I've seen this happen in Arizona. I've been up in the Rocky Mountains, high in the mountains where most people don't even go, and I've found up there shepherds with thousands of, they, they, the sheep are in, in Phoenix during the winter, but during the summer, they have to go up into the higher altitudes of the Rockies because it's just too hot for them down in Phoenix. So I think that this migratory pattern is reflected in the structure of the 23rd Psalm. David would have known this. Now, David lived a thousand years after Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but the same family and they were making the same route, probably with the descendants of the very same sheep. So that this family, whose they were farmers, they were herdsmen, they had rented or probably bought pastures up in Shechem and up in Dothan, and they tended to them during the year, but they were the summer pasture grounds. So when you read the 23rd Psalm, I believe that after verse one, which is the theme, you begin this migratory pattern until you end up back at the Father's house. Now, the theme of Psalm 23 is found in verse one. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. All of us have needs, and God created us that way. He could have made us so we didn't need anything, but he made us with external needs, so we need clothing and we need water, we need food, we need the necessities of life. He made us with internal needs. We need a sense of purpose, we need self-worth, we need love, and he made us with eternal needs because we know that this life is very fleeting. Is there anything beyond it? We need to know that. We have a need. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. It's very interesting that the new atheism has fallen apart and many of the young people who went after the four horsemen of the atheists are now coming to Christianity because the implications of the atheistic philosophy is not psychologically tenable. And they're reinvestigating Christianity because we have eternal needs within us. You have an eternal need. You need to live forever, to be with God in heaven, to be with your loved ones. The Bible says there's a heaven and there's a hell, and we have eternal needs that only Jesus Christ can meet. And when the Lord is your shepherd, he meets all of your needs. That's verse one. Now, at that point, having stated the theme, David now, who wrote this, is going to say, let me take you on a little tour of your life, and I'll show you that. So, in verse number two, he says, hear 
and Hebron, here at the Father's ranch, there are still waters. There's green grass during the winter. There is the shepherd who will restore you if you get into trouble. It's a good place to be. It's wonderful when we are in a place where things are sort of idyllic in life. And the grass is green and the water is cool and we've got a shepherd nearby. And the picture here is one of contentment. Contentment is quiet joy. It's not necessarily loud joy like a fireworks display. It's just that quiet joy that is like the purring of a kitten or the, a cup of tea in the afternoon or a fire on a cold night. And there is something within us that needs that kind of contentment. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. But we get that sense of inner peace and contentment from the pasturage of Scripture. And you know the word pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, and the word pasture are basically the same word. A good pastor, like yours, is someone who will lead you into the pasture of Scripture and feed you. That's really one of the main jobs of the shepherd is to make sure the sheep are well fed and God feeds us with His Word and with the water of the Holy Spirit that takes the Word of God and makes it alive to us. I had sheep for a while. Our daughters raised sheep. So we always had to keep the pasture as healthy as we could and have the water trough filled with water. But I learned that on some mornings, the dew is so heavy on that grass, the sheep don't need any water. They eat and drink at the same time with this wet grass. And I've come to think that is a very lovely picture of the spirit-drenched Word of God. And I want to encourage you every single morning or every single day to get up and to feed on the Scripture. When I'd wake up and look out the back window, those sheep were already in the pasture up on their feet, and they were eating to their heart's content. And for a long time after that, they would either be grazing or they would get down on their haunches and be chewing up what they'd eaten, sort of like we are to do with the Scripture. And when we are in God's Word, there comes into us a contentment because we know that our shepherd is nearby, and if we get into trouble, he is there to help us. He restores our souls. This is revival. This is when we need someone to help us do in our lives what we cannot do by ourselves. The picture here is of a sheep that gets over on its back. Maybe it's gotten into the mud and its wool is matted with mud and it's heavy and maybe the sheep is, is heavy anyway and it gets, somehow it rolls over on its back, maybe down a little hill or a ditch. And if a sheep has got four feet sticking up in the air, it cannot right itself. It will die there unless the shepherd comes and he gets it. And that kind of sheep is called a cast sheep or a cast down sheep. And the psalmist said in Psalm 42, why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. And when you find yourself cast down, it is the good shepherd who knows how to get you back on your feet. Now, he may use people to encourage you. He may use scriptures to lift you up. He'll use his Holy Spirit within you. And in some cases, it may require counseling or someone with the gift of wisdom to come alongside you, but he will get you back on your feet. You've got to look to him. If some of you are cast down today, then look to the shepherd. He alone knows how to really restore not just our minds or our emotions, but our very souls. He restores my soul. So that is the home base. Now, at some point, those sheep, they're going to begin to say, this grass isn't as good as it was. It's drying up. And they'll see the shepherd get up, pack his little bag, get his rod and his staff, get his flute, get his slingshot, get some grub, and he'll, one day he'll start down the road and he'll whistle and he'll be the whistle for the sheep and the sheep will follow him and he will lead them in paths of righteousness for his own namesake, for the sake of his reputation as a shepherd. And that's the journey. The Lord knows how to lead us from one stage to the other. It says in the New International Version in 
Numbers chapter 33, to write down all of the stages through which the Lord leads us. God guides us in stages, and there are transitions, and sometimes they're a little unsettling to go through transitions. I've been through a few transitions in the last five or six years, and I didn't adjust to them as quickly as I thought I would, but the Lord knows how to lead us in the right paths. He's a God who guides us. And I told my grandson, who is 19 years old, I was in Italy with him, and we were in a little church, and I said, let's kneel down and pray about your future. And I said, you know, you don't have to know what you're going to be doing five or 10 or 15 years from now. You don't have to have your whole career mapped out. You just need to know the next step, just the next step. And if you don't know it, then guess, prayerfully guess, and the Lord will lead you in that way, one step at a time. And we knelt down and had prayer about it. The Lord knows how to lead you and to guide you one step at a time. He leads us in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Now, sometimes that pathway goes through valleys. And that's the third stage. The sheep looked up, and they see that the passageway is beginning to get narrow. And the walls of the cliffs are high, and the sunlight doesn't get through, and it's darker, and it's dangerous. And so the psalmist said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Have you ever thought about that little word, yea, or even? It isn't there by accident. The psalmist is saying, the Lord leads me in the right paths, yes, even if I go through a valley. So the verses are connected there. He is leading you, and sometimes you find that you're in a valley, and it can be very frightening. And many expositors believe that David had in mind here the old Jericho Road that they would have taken, and I've been on that road. I've hiked some of it, and it's very narrow, and in those days it was very dangerous. This is where Jesus said the man fell among thieves, and they stripped him and robbed him and beat him and left him in the ditch to die. There were wild animals there. There were bandits there. And we look around and we say, I'm in a valley and it's very frightening. And some of you may be in a valley right now and it seems frightening. But this is where the pronoun changes. Up until now, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me, he guides me. And now all of a sudden, you are with me. This is where the Psalm becomes very personal. And it's in the valley when it's no longer the Lord, it is you. You are with me here, and we sense His presence in ways that we don't otherwise. I've found in my life that the greatest insights spiritually have come to me during some of the most difficult times. We are driven to the Scripture. We are driven to the Lord because we don't have anywhere else to turn, and we find that the Lord He is there close to us, and we don't need to be afraid. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And we learn to practice his presence. There was a man named Emery, Alan Emery, who had a large uh, textile operation, made clothing and fabric that was sold all over the world. And so one day he was, I don't know, maybe in Australia, but he wanted to go out and spend the night with the sheep and the shepherds that provided a lot of his wool. And he said that he was out there and it was, the sun had gone down and the fire was dying down and the dogs had died down and the sheep were all on their haunches getting ready to go to sleep. And suddenly there was the howling of the wolves and the dogs jumped up and started to bark and to go as protectors. And the sheep all got up and were uneasy and the shepherd got up and he threw the logs on the fire and the sparks went upward And Alan said he looked out at all of the sheep, and he saw thousands of little lights, lights. And he realized it was the fire reflecting in the eyes of the sheep, that in a moment of danger, the sheep weren't looking out at the danger, they were looking towards the shepherd. Well, this is exactly what the psalmist is saying here, even in the dark valley I'll not be afraid. I'll look to the shepherd for you are with me. 
And then you emerge because it says through. That's the preposition there. Even though I walk through the dark valley, I'll not be afraid you're with me. And we come out on the tableland, a table you have prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. So the shepherds had this field near Shechem and then another field a few miles away near Dothan. And so they dug the wells there for the water. They could fill up the trough so that they overflowed. And they had cleaned out the pastures, the rocks over the generations that made good pasture lands there. And so they were there away from other people. If the sheep got hurt, what do you do? Well, you use the oil to heal the wounds. When we had sheep once, we also had a horse for a while in the same pasture. And I went out and the horse had bitten off half of the sheep's ear. Lucy was the sheep. And um, I thought, what am I going to do? I, I don't think a vet will come out just to, you know, for an ear. So I remembered actually this passage. And I went up to the pantry and I got some olive oil and I started bathing her ear with olive oil. And pretty soon it just healed up beautifully. And not long afterwards, I was at the state fair in Nashville and I was looking at all of the 4-H people bringing their beautiful sheep in. And I asked one of them about it. And they pointed and said, there's our bottle of olive oil. It's an amazing thing when you get a nick or a cut on a sheep or there is a bite or something. It's just the best medicine we have. Well, the oil here, I think, is the Holy Spirit. Because in the Bible, oil is frequently a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. So the Lord Jesus takes the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit with His Word and in other ways will tend to our hurts and our cuts and our disappointments and our heartaches and the things that happen to us, the Lord knows how to care for us. And also, He draws up the water and our cups overflow. Can you just see the troughs overflowing as the shepherd hauls up the water and pours it into the troughs? We have what we need, and we have so much more than we need. Up here on the tablelands, at this point in our life, the Lord provides our needs. He tends for us. And there's a wonderful verse in the Gospel of John chapter 1 that in the old version of the New International Version, it says, it's John chapter 1 verse 16, I think, out of the fullness of His grace, He has given us one blessing after another. And I thought, what a wonderful New Testament counterpart to Psalm 23, my cup overflows. But then they came out with the 2011 New International Version, and I read that verse, and it says something like, from the fullness of His grace, we have all received grace in the place of grace. And I thought, that isn't as good. Why did they change it? And I actually went to the president of the Translation Society, and I said, why did you change this? And he said, we were making it more literal. That is literally what the Greek says, and we wanted to be true to the text. So I began thinking about it and realized John wrote his gospel in Ephesus near the Mediterranean. He would have known the crashing of the waves of the Mediterranean as it came in, one wave after the other, the way that we've all seen if you go down to the beach. And this was the picture he used. You know, when a wave comes in, it crashes onto the shore, recedes, and then another one comes right after it and recedes, and another one. And that's the picture here. Out of the fullness of His grace, He gives us grace, and the place of grace He's already given. It is a never-ending supply of grace. Our cups overflow. That's the blessings that we have in following Him. And then He says in the last verse, you know, the end of the summer comes, and we circle back where? To the Father's house. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I used to think 
The three things followed us when I was a child. I memorized this, as I told you in the second grade. I thought surely and goodness and mercy were three different things. Now I realize he is saying absolutely for sure these two things are going to follow you. Goodness, which is God's grace in all of its dimensions, and mercy. And the, Greek, uh, the, the Hebrew word here for follow is a more aggressive word. It is typically translated chase or pursue. So if you read about David being pursued or chased by Saul through the wilderness, this is the same word that David used. Goodness and mercy will chase me. And I'm convinced that the reference here, I can't prove it, but the reference here are to sheep dogs. If you have ever seen videos of how dogs can herd sheep. So David was one person. He may have had 500, 600 sheep. He went in front of them, but who tended to the stragglers? Who made sure that all of the sheep in the back of the pack were together and weren't being picked off by the predators? Well, sheep dogs are amazing. And there are, the Lord is going in front of us. He's our shepherd. But his two sheep dogs named goodness and mercy are following us and they are pursuing us. And it says all the days of our lives, all the days, not just one here and there, not even most of the days, not even all of the days except that worst day of your life, all the days of my life, goodness and mercy follow me. And then where do we end up? Back in the house of the Lord, back in the Father's house. Now, for the sheep, that would have been cycling back to Hebron at the end of the fall for the winter season. But for David and his analogy here, it's cycling up to heaven. That's where we end up. And Jesus referred to this. I think he referred to the 23rd Psalm at least twice in his teachings. And one had to do with the beginning of the Psalm. The other had to do with the ending of the Psalm. When he said, I am the good shepherd, I think he was referring to the Lord is my shepherd. When we read the 23rd Psalm, we identify with the sheep. But when Jesus read the 23rd Psalm, he identified with the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. My sheep know my voice. They follow me. They come when I call. I lay down my life for the sheep. And at the end, it says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And Jesus said in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. He was going back to the 23rd Psalm. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And when my wife was near death, I whispered over to her and I said, you know, I'm gonna make a date with you. Let's go walking soon, hand by hand along the Crystal River. And it was very real to me, you know, that we're going to be reunited in heaven and the new heavens and the new earth and the new city of Jerusalem are very real and very literal. And the Bible ends with a two chapter travel log about our father's house and how much we have to look forward to. So wherever you are in life, you are somewhere in Psalm 23 right now if you are following the shepherd. What verse are you in? I've got an acquaintance, he's in heaven now, but his name was Maurice Pink, P-I-N-K. He was a British man. I never met him in person, but we talked on the phone several times. He was serving with the Royal British Navy in the South Pacific during World War II. And the ship he was on was targeted by the Japanese Air Force and it sunk in seven minutes and many sailors perished. And Maurice told me that he ran to the deck, he stripped off every, he says, every stitch and he, he plunged naked into the ocean and the ocean was filled with smoke and with fuel, with oil, and with sharks. And he was there naked, treading water as his ship and other ships went down around him. But he said the 23rd Psalm was what kept him afloat. And he said, he said to me, would you like for me to read what I have written about that day? I'd like to read it to you. And he did. 
and I asked him to send me a copy, and I actually put it in the book that I wrote on the 23rd Psalm. But I want to read you what this man said following his deliverance from this water. He said, there are times in your life when things don't go right and you feel all alone. That happened to me on December the 10th, 1941, when I was on the battle cruiser HMS Repulse with the nearby HMS Prince of Wales. We were attacked by the Japanese Air Force, which resulted in both ships being sunk. And I found myself alone in the water, not able to see anybody else. It was then that the 23rd Psalm came into my head and I realized I was not alone. I had a shepherd. The Lord was my shepherd. I did not need to want. I was not in green pastures, but in oily waters, but he restored my soul. Even though I was walking in the shadow of death, I was to fear no evil for he was with me. The rod and the staff didn't ring a bell unto me until voices above me were shouting. Looking up, there was a big destroyer alongside me, the HMS Electra, with nets over the side, which allowed me to climb up to safety. There was my rod and my staff. I didn't have a table set before me, but I did get a cup of the ship's cocoa. Since that day, goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. And when I think back to that day, I wonder what would have happened if I had died. There again, the psalm had the answer. I would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Lord, for being my shepherd and for the 23rd Psalm. Now, my question for you is, do you have a good relationship with the shepherd? Maybe you've wandered out of the fold. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've followed everyone into his own ways. And it could be that you just don't have a good relationship with the Lord right now. You may not know him at all. Or maybe you have a relationship with him, but it's not what it used to be. And you just feel like you are wandering away from the very one who can meet all of your needs. I want to invite you today to make sure the good shepherd is your shepherd, not to leave here or to go anywhere if you're watching online until you nail that down. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest in meadows green and he feeds me beside the quiet stream. He keeps on giving life to me and he helps me to do what honors him the most. Even when walking through the dark valley of death, I'll not be afraid for you're close beside me, guiding, guarding all the way. You spread a feast before me. In the presence of my enemies, you welcome me as your special guest. With blessings overflowing, your goodness and unfailing kindness will be with me all of my days. And afterwards, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That's our shepherd. Make sure... He's yours. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, for anyone here who doesn't have the relationship with the shepherd that they desperately need right now, speak to them, to those who are in green pastures, those who are in dark valleys, those who are on the tableland, those who are being chased by goodness and mercy. Lord, may we ever grow closer to you. And may this psalm be the way that we live day after day after day as we make our way towards the Father's house is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Would you join me in saying thank you to Dr. Robert Morgan for preaching God's word in such an effective way. I want to invite you to stand across this room. Our pastors are going to be here, 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 and here in the balcony area. You don't have to come all the way down. They'll be on the landing. But if you need to trust in Christ, you need to make him your shepherd today, I want you to come. If you want to join our church, maybe you want to sign up for baptism, whatever decision God has laid on your heart, right now as we begin singing, I want you to come. If you came with someone, they'll come with you. Come on, right now. Come on and praise the If you need prayer, our pastors are here. God bless you. Never want you to leave without your questions answered. If you'd
you'd like to join our faith community, trust in Christ, you come. Come on and praise the Beautiful. Anybody else? Never want you to leave without your questions answered. God bless you. You can always go to our connection room, which is in the back of our auditorium here, our worship center to my back right, your left. And uh, if you ever have any questions or need prayer, um, you can just go right there. We have ministers on our team. We have volunteers in our church that would love to talk with you, put resources in your hand. We want to do whatever we can to help you move forward in your walk with Christ. Just a couple of announcements before you go. One, our gifts for troops drive is going on. You can go by our military ministry, which is a great ministry in our church right down the great hall, or just take your phone and scan that right there. Get a list of items that we're putting together to get to our troops. Uh, What a wonderful thing that we do uh, for those that are serving in our military. Also, I can't believe I'm making this announcement. Are you ready for this? Christmas is here, all right? Christmas Spectacular is uh, upon us. And so just go to HoustonChristmas.org and go ahead and get your tickets. We added an extra performance this year and uh, we'll pack this place out the 10th through the 15th. Bring someone who doesn't know Christ. It's a great opportunity uh, for them to hear the gospel. And then finally, October 20th, uh, I'm gonna be baptizing along with a couple of our other pastors. And if you've never made your profession of faith public and would like to be baptized, you can text BAPTISM to 7706 and it'll be a great day of celebration as we baptize uh, those who are professing Christ. So uh, as you leave, go by the great lawn, eat, hang out outside. Thank you for being here. Be back next week and uh, we'll see you then. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.